morning, class. How you doing? Wow. How many of you are doing great today? Like, raise your hand if you're doing great. Wow. It was only 20% in the chapel, so you're, you're way up. Yeah, I can tell you you're all doing better than you think you are because you're here. So thank you for that. You're helping me do well today. Today, we are continuing our class at Riverbend Graduate School of Theology on the study of what's called the five solas. The five solas are five Latin terms that evolved out of the Reformation in the 1500s that kind of form a structure upon which the Protestant church was built and the Reformation was built. These five solas really didn't coalesce until about 100 years ago, but each of them was attributed or rooted in the Reformation thinking. We began two weeks ago with the first of the five called sola gratia, or grace alone. Last week, we had the privilege of having Dr. Alan Hilton, a real professor, a professor of theology from Yale University, come and share with us the wisdom of sola fide, which is faith alone. Next week, we will wrestle with one of the more difficult of the five solas, which is sola scriptura, which is exactly as it sounds, the Bible alone. And then we will conclude our study with the consideration of soli deo gloria, or for God's glory alone. But today, we are focusing on the middle, the central, the third of the five solas, and it is called solus Christos, or Christ alone. Now the root of the, uh, of the origin of this priority of Christ alone takes root back in the Reformation. During the Reformation, there were there was a frustration with how the church had atrophied, with how the church bureaucracy had become layered so significantly that, that people felt disconnected from God, even though they were part of the church. And part of the reason for this was a doctrine called sacri or sacerdotalism or sacerdotalism. Uh, sacer sacerdotalism is the, is the doctrine of the Catholic Church that says that it is only through an ordained priest that a person can gain direct access to God. Now, this theological position, this doctrine, evolved over 1,500 years, and the Catholics traced back the origins of this sacerdotal doctrine to Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock, or this Petros, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the Catholic doctrine said that Peter was commissioned, ordained in that moment by Jesus, to be the mediator between men and God through the church. And so that Catholic ordination was then the paying forward, the connection, all the way back to Peter, who was ordained by Jesus. And that intercessory role was the role of the priests. Sacerdotal doctrine suggests that it is only the priests who can oversee the ordinances and the sacraments of the church, baptism and communion and marriage, and perhaps most significantly, the doctrine of absolution, have any of you heard of the doctrine of absolution or you are familiar with the last rites of the Catholic Church? The prerogative was that a Catholic priest, because they were ordained in the historical lineage back to Peter and Jesus, they had the authority to forgive sins. Well, some of the people during the time of the Reformation, not the least of which was Martin Luther, they had a problem with this. You see, as they began to translate the Bible into the German language, they stumbled across some teaching that said, this isn't right. 
particularly 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where Paul says there is one mediator between God and man, and that is solus Christos, the man Christ Jesus, and him alone. And you see, the roots of this idea that Christ is sort of the model, or Christ is the mediator, or Christ is the template for every person's life, is what I want us to examine today. And as we wrestle with what does it mean for solus Christos, for us to apply that to our lives, I want to suggest that it comes down to one word. And that word is kenosis. The Greek word kenosis is the summary of what it means to live solus Christos. Today, as we examine what does it mean for us to live for only Christ, I want us to figure out what that word means. But before we undertake our class today, I feel like I should pray. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I would ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing in your sight that you would use your word spoken by your servant and anointed by your spirit to remind us that there is no halfway. There is no half poured out or half full. For you seek all of us and the best of us. Pray that we might be courageous enough to build our lives on solus Christos. Pray that for myself and for my family and for all of us here. For I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I suspect that when you came in or when the chalkboard was rolled out, you saw this little figure here, and you said, that looks like Jesus right there. <laughs> Look at Jesus. I, did, I don't think since the Shroud of Turin, anyone has really ever represented Jesus so accurately. Well, that's kind of what I want us to think of today. When we think of solus Christus, when, it think, when we think of what does it mean to believe that a priority in our life is Christ alone or Christ first or Christ only, that it becomes sort of a measure. It becomes the template. It becomes the standard to which we pursue. In our lives, we said we, we live our life and anyone who lives a healthy life has hopes and dreams and, and objectives and goals and, and is driven to move their life forward. And all of those can be good things. They can be good relational goals and financial goals, professional goals and personal goals and health goals. But most of those, the goalposts keep moving. If we have as our goal to be like Christ alone, solus Christus, those are goalposts that haven't moved in 2,000 years. He is the same today as he was then, and it will be the same 2,000 years from now. So what does it mean for us to pursue that idea that, that our lives are intended to look like, to reflect solus Christus, Christ alone? And the guide I want to look at, and we can look at many passages in the Bible that would help us understand this, I want to look at one, an ancient hymn. I think it was a hymn. It may have just been a poem. And we don't know where it originated. It might have been the Apostle Paul who originated it, or it might have been someone in one of the early churches. We certainly don't know the music that went along with it. But it was a, a piece of poetry, a psalm, as it were, and it's the only one in all of Paul's writings. And it's found in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, In your relationship with one another, let this mind have the same mind as Christ Jesus. And then the psalm begins. Who was in his very nature God? But he did not consider equality with God something that he had to hold tightly onto or something that he had to use for his own benefit, something that he had to take that was not his. But he humbled, he, he, he took on, the very, but he emptied himself, taking on the very nature of a servant, 
being found in human likeness, he became a man just as we are and humbled himself. He humbled himself even to death. The most painful and awful death conceivable, even death on a cross. Therefore God raised him up and made him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, whether on the earth or in heaven or under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This was the confession, the hymn, the liturgy of the early church. And it is a call for you and I, an invitation for you and I to live solus Christu. Now, I want to look at this passage. I want to look at these five verses chiastically. Chiasm is, is from the Greek letter chi, X. And, and Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 10, unfolds chiastically. Now, I want to take a moment to, to give you a free professional speaker's tip. I know many of you give sales presentations regularly, and, and some of you are, are corporate executives, and you're in front of groups of your employees. Some of you are, are professors. Some of you are teachers. Some of you are politicians. Most everyone in the congregation at Riverbend, at some time or another, will be asked to be in front of people and speak to them and to teach them. And I want to help you not suck at that. And what I have learned, and it doesn't mean that I am an expert, but I have learned by trial and error that there, there are a number of ways to do that well. In fact, in my life, I've found that there are three different ways to communicate, to teach, to, to create a presentation that has the best chance of not boring people to tears. And there's a fourth method, but I, I prefer for you not to practice that, and that's the ramble on and on until people get up and leave method. That, that's not acceptable. But the first method is, 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 the, is the litigation method. If you, if you are charged with giving a talk, one way to give a, an interesting talk is to make an argument. If this, then this. Because of this, then that. It's sort of a quid pro quo or a cause and effect. It's like you're building a case. You're making an argument. And you put all of the pieces of your argument together so that when you are finished, you have an airtight conclusion. And if you've done it well, people will walk away going, well, that was a good point. Or I believe that. Or I'll buy that product. The litigation method is, is very common, particularly when you're dealing with a lot of data and facts and information, or you want to close a sale. The second way to communicate is what I call the Mark Twain method, or the Garrison Keillor method, or the Gerald Mann method. It's to tell a story. Stories are great if you know how to tell a story. Stories follow a certain pattern. Stories have characters that are interesting, and, and they usually unfold in three acts. There's the information and the setting and the circumstances. Then there's the tension or the problem, and the hero comes to four or the struggle. And then the third chapter is the resolution, and the boy gets the girl, and, and the good guys win and the bad guys lose. And at the end, everybody goes, yes, oh, that was so good. That was such a great moving story. But that's really hard to do. There's very few really great storytellers out there. And I'm not smart enough to do the litigation method, and I'm not talented enough to do the story method, so I rely on the chiastic method. The chiastic method basically says that your talk, your presentation, has one main point. There's one big idea. I was taught in homiletics 101 that every message you preach is basically three points. You tell people what you're going to tell them, then you tell them what you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. That's a chiasm. You see, a chiasm goes like this. You make your first point, you introduce it, perhaps A sub 1. And then your second point is B sub 1, but your main point is C. And then you say the application of that is B sub 2, and then you wind up back where you started at A sub 2. So that basically what you do is you tell people what you're going to tell them, you tell them what you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And it's really hard to screw that up. If you don't believe me, come back next week or the week after, because that's what I do every week. 
Because it's really simple. And that's what happens in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, the point is the kenosis. What does it mean to be solus Christus? How do we live a life that looks like Christ? And it begins in verse 6. In verse 6, it begins with this challenge, and I put it this way, to consider yourself And I could have put carefully, I could have put graciously, I could have put honestly, but I put generously. Consider yourself generously. What does it say in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6? It says, he, even though he was in his very nature God, he did not consider that equality with God something that he had, on, had to hold on to tightly. Jesus was in in infinite measure, fully God. Now that's hard for us. That, that, that's hard for us to accept. What does it mean that Jesus was fully God? But it wasn't hard for the early apostles. In fact, it wasn't hard for the early church. The early church had no problem believing that Jesus was in fact God. Because his teaching was so radical. His, 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 his life was so unique that they had a hard time believing that Jesus was actually human. There were some of the early church fathers who wrote and they said, I don't know if when Jesus walked on the sand on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, whether he would actually leave footprints. But he was surely God. And the apostles believed this as well because they had seen the miracles. They knew how radical his teaching was. But most of all, you know what they saw? They saw people worship him. There's a story in Matthew chapter 14 where Jesus walks on the water. Perhaps you remember the story. He comes out on the Sea of Galilee and he's walking toward the boat and Peter sees him. And Peter says, Lord, I want to walk on the water too. And Jesus says, sure, come on. And Peter gets out of the boat and we don't know how far he walked, maybe two steps, maybe 20 steps. But then he saw the wind and the waves. Remember the story? And he starts to sink. But Jesus walks up to him and lifts him out of the water. And then they get in the boat, and it says when they got in the boat, the moment they got in the boat, the sea grew calm, and the wind died down. And then it says that all those who were in the boat worshipped him. Do you realize how blasphemous that is? That's a violation of the first of the Ten Commandments. There is no other God other than Yahweh God. And to attribute God or call anyone else God is the highest form of blasphemy. But Jesus didn't say, hold on, guys. That's a little much. I'm a really great teacher. I'm a really good guy. I'm a really great pal. I can do some amazing things. But don't, don't, don't mix. No, he said, bring it. In John chapter 9, there's a story where Jesus heals a blind man. And, the, and he put mud on the man's eyes and he said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash and be healed. So the man never saw Jesus. And later in that chapter, Jesus finds him. And he says, do you believe in the son of man? And the man who can now see, who was born blind, goes, if I could see him, I would believe it. And Jesus says, he's standing right here. You're looking at him. And what does the man do? He says he falls down and he worships him. See, Jesus was never afraid to allow people to recognize that, that he was, in fact, the very image of God, the very presence of God. And I think the thing that we have to get our heads around, if we are going to, if we are going to be imitators of that, is that the Imago Dei resides in us, too. That the image of God is in us, that we have the ability to choose to do the right thing. We have the ability to choose to be the kind of people we want to be. And I know life gets in the way, and life gets hard, and we have damage, and we have wounds, and we walk with a limp because of, because of the injuries that we suffer, but we still have enough of the image of God in us that we can always choose. We can always choose to be like him. When people let us down or when life, when life kicks us to the curb, we can still choose our attitude. All of the other creatures on this planet are guided by their instinct. We alone have the image of God. Consider yourself graciously. Consider yourself honestly. Consider yourself thoughtfully. And not only that, 
recognize that that Imago Dei is in everyone else you meet. And when you start to consider these things, you will be thinking like Solus Christus. But Philippians chapter 2 unfolds next. There in verse 6 it says, it says, even though he was in his very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something that he had to tightly grasp. And it, I, I put it this way, let go, let yourself go. Even though he was in his very nature God, he did not consider that equality with God was something that, that he had to use for his own advantage. I don't like that translation in the NIV. The word, the word there is, is arpagmon. Arpagmon literally means to rob, to steal, to take something that is not rightfully yours. You know the difference between burglary and robbery, right? Burglary is where you take something from someone. Robbery is where you violently or forcefully take something that's not yours from someone else. And the, the word arpagmon in the Greek implies that sort of, that violence. In fact, in, uh, I think it's in John chapter 7, Jesus is talking about, about uh, false teachers and he says those false teachers are like our Pogmon wolves. They're like ferocious wolves. What it implies is that Jesus didn't have to prove anything to anybody. That Jesus didn't have to prove that he was God. He didn't have to take what wasn't rightfully his. He could let it go. Do any of you know who Barry Sanders is? Barry Sanders, the NFL football player. He was born in Wichita, Kansas in 1968, one of my favorite football players of all time. Now, I don't hold it against him that when he was a high school American, he decided to go play football at Oklahoma State. But he went to Oklahoma State, and he was an All-American there, too. He was considered the best running back in the nation. In 1989, when he graduated, he was the number three draft pick in the NFL. Number one that year was a guy named Troy Aikman. Number two was a roided out lineman named Tony Mandrich who never amounted to anything. Number three was Barry Sanders. He went to the woeful Detroit Lions. He played for the Detroit Lions for 10 years. He led the NFL in rushing for four years. He was in the Pro Bowl all 10 years of his NFL career. In 1997, he was the NFL MVP, the most valuable player in the league, and he retired the next year. He was inducted into the, into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2004. But what makes him my favorite player of, of one of my favorite players in the NFL is you know what Barry Sanders did every time he scored a touchdown? He never celebrated. He never danced. He never even spiked the ball. He would just take the football, hand it to the referee, and run back to the sidelines. And one time somebody asked him, he said, Barry, why don't you celebrate when you score a touchdown. And he quoted the famous Vince Lombardi when he said, because I've been there before and I'm gonna be there again. This isn't a new thing for me. Vince Lombardi famously said, when you score a touchdown, act like you've been there before. That's what it means to Solus Christus. Act like you, are, you and I are children of God. We don't, it's not something that we, have to, that, we have to, that we have to prove. You know what the opposite of pride is? Or the opposite of humility is? You know what the opposite of humility is? It's not pride. The opposite of humility is not pride. The opposite of humility is insecurity. Because I have never seen a person who is insecure be genuinely humble. The person who is insecure is always either seeking to, to make sure everyone understands how important they are and how influential they are and remind the people around them that they, that they have something to say, or they are feigning a false humility so that they can promote a reaction from people, well, I'm not that great, and they just want people to say they are. The opposite of humility is insecurity. The opposite, the opposite of pride is contentment. To be humble and to be content is what it means to be solus Christus. He didn't have to ferociously 
plunder or take what wasn't his. But then we come to the point in verse 7 of Philippians chapter 2. It says that he poured himself out. We pour ourselves out. We kenosis. He made himself nothing. The word is literally a verb, kenao, and it's ek, en, o, ekenosen. And it's the first, second person indicative, uh, aorist tense. It is the past tense of to pour or to empty yourself out. Kenosis means to pour out or to empty out. And the word that is used there is in the aorist tense. Now, we don't have an equivalent for that in the English language. There is, we have past, present, and future. In the Greek, they had a tense called the aorist tense. And the aorist tense is a particular expression of a certainty of a past action. It highlights the reality or the confidence that this actually happened. It is an affirmation. It's, it's to say that he poured himself out completely. That's the purpose of the heiress tense. In fact, I had a professor in, in graduate school who wrote a Greek grammar. Who does that? Who spends their life writing a grammar of New Testament Greek? Well, his name was Dan Wallace, and he wrote this brilliant grammar, and this is what he says about the aorist tense. He says, the aorist normally views the actions as a whole, taking no interest in the internal workings of the action. It describes the action in summary fashion without focusing on the beginning or the end of the action specifically. The aorist covers a multitude of actions. The event may be iterative in nature, or durative, or momentary, but the aorist says none of this. It places the stress on the fact of the reality and the certainty of the occurrence. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Dave, that's 10 minutes of my life. I can't ever get back. What in the wide world of sports are you doing taking our time, our precious time, when we got ourselves to church on a Sunday morning to beat us over the head with Greek grammar and tell us about the freaking heiress tense that nobody cares about, Dave? I'll tell you why. Because it's exactly what you're looking for. It's exactly the cry of your soul of the hundreds of you that I know and the thousands of you that I have met, I have yet to meet one person who said to me, you know what my life goal is, Dave? To be mediocre. You know what I want to do with my life? I want to mail it in. You know what I want to people to say at the end of my life, at my funeral? They, I want them to say, he tried really hard. <laughs> now, I have never met a person in this community who doesn't understand what it means to go for it. To say, to say this, this, this is the focus of my life. This is worth the sacrifice. This is worth the price. Whether it's my relationships or my profession or my education or, or my health. In, in the people that I have met in this place, and I'll use another Greek technical term, there is no half-assery. I have yet to see it, because we are not made for that. And I realize life gets in the way, and, and sometimes all we can do is just get by. And we have seasons where, where, where it's, I just want to make it to the next day, but we all know it is imprinted on our soul that we, are, that we are made for great things, we are made for amazing things, and to do that becomes the aorist. It means that we're all in. You see, he didn't pour himself halfway out. He didn't empty himself partially. When it says that he emptied himself, it means he poured all that he is and all that he has and all that he could be into that. And that is the cry of our soul. That we can be echinosin. 
that we can pour ourselves out into something that matters, something that makes a difference. And the invitation of Philippians chapter 2, the invitation of Solus Christus, is that is it. Build your life on becoming like him, reflecting him, demonstrating him. Let him be the goal and pursue it with all your might. Pour yourself out. Empty yourself. Now nature abhors a vacuum and once we begin the process of emptying ourselves out, something fills it back up. And that's what happens there in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, it invites us to step yourself, step ourselves up. What does it mean to step up there in Philippians chapter 2? It says, even though he was in his very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something that he had to hold on to, but he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being found in human likeness, being in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on a cross. You know what backfills us when we pour ourselves out serving others he took on the very nature of a servant empathy he says it was found in human likeness he understands us he's like us he gets us when we empathize with others we are backfilling Christ likeness that solus Christus in our life he was obedient or he was humble. He took, he became in the very appearance as a man, humbling himself. The fourth thing is obedience. He became obedient, even unto death, even the death on a cross. The fifth thing is sacrifice. I realize that there's nothing really sexy about this idea, but it, it reminds us that, that we are here to make the lives of others better. And we do that by serving, by empathizing, by humbling ourselves, by obeying, and by sacrificing. That's what it means to solus Christos. And the result of this is that we bow ourselves down. Verses 9 and 10 it says that therefore God exalted him. God raised him up to the highest place. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue, and every knee should bow, whether on the earth or, or above the earth or under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because this is worship. This is what worship looks like when we decide that this will be my goal, this will be my metric, this will be my calling. It is worship. See, we, are, we, have, we have an undeveloped, we have an infantile sense of what worship is. We think we're consumers. We think worship is something that we consume. We think worship is something that is meant to entertain us. That worship is something that is meant to make us feel good. But worship is not passive. Worship is active. Worship is in the offering. Worship is in the giving. Worship is in the sacrificing. Worship is participatory. Worship doesn't happen to us. Worship happens with us. Worship comes from us. And we are made for this. In Romans chapter 12, in the first verse, the Apostle Paul describes for us what worship is. He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, for this is your holy act of spiritual worship. To present our bodies, to serve and to obey and to be humble and to be empathetic and to sacrifice. To be like Christ. To be solos Christus. And I realize, if you break this down, it sounds kind of like spiritual aerobics. 
that after we consider ourselves, we let go and we pour out and we step up and we bow down. Okay, on three. Let go, bow down, step up, pour out. Okay, again. I mean, but it is. It is, it is fashioning our life in such a way that it says, all of the things that I might accomplish or all of the things that I could be, of all of these things, the thing that matters most is that I look more and more like this, like Solus Christus. See, this is the template. This is the, this is the measure. This is the image that you and I are, are called, we are invited to build our life toward that. It, it, it comes full circle. It's kind of chiastic. Because what difference does it make? What does verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2 say? Verse 5 says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. What is it like? What does it mean to be a great parent? What does it mean to be a great spouse? What does it mean to be a great neighbor? What does it mean to be a great employee? What does it mean to be a great boss? What does it mean to be a great friend? It means be like this. In your relationships with one another, let this be your mind. You see, the Reformation didn't take place just 1,500 years ago. It wasn't a thing that happened once. It's a thing that happens in our lives every day. Because that spiritual entropy, that, that atrophy of passion happens to us as individuals, not just us as communities, not just us as organizations. It happens to us individually. And that reformation needs to take place in us every day as we challenge ourselves to say, how am I doing? Am I, am I actually more like this than I was yesterday or I was five years ago? It's a daunting thing. It's, a, it's an intimidating thing to be that Im Im intimate and to be that personal. But that's the reformation that we're talking about. How do we change our lives? How do we improve our lives? How do we set our lives on a course of meaning? So is Christos. Next week, come together and we wrestle with Sola Scriptura. And Dr. Hilton will be back with us so you get the real theology. But this week, you're stuck with me. And we're back with the chiasm. And we end where we began. I leave you with the question we started with. How you doing? Thanks for being here today. Class dismissed. Have a great week. See you next Sunday.